Grace and peace to you from the one who is faithful to us, beginning at baptism and ending when we see him face to face in heaven and actually not ending but lasting for eternity. A portion of our Savior's word which we consider this morning is the reading from 2 Timothy which Pastor read a few moments ago. We will refer to it as we go along. My friends, so what comes when life is done? As Christians, you know the quick answer to that. And yet we live in a world that has a whole bunch of different answers to that question. Whether it's the idea of reincarnation, that you continue on as something else, whether it's the idea that there's some type of happy hunting ground, or the idea that you somehow become one with the universe, or any number of things which our scripture does not teach. You know what the right answer is, because you know your Savior. This morning, as we look at St. Paul at the end of his life, we will look at his end, but we will also look at our end, which is a new beginning. And so we ask the question, are you ready? And we look at it in two ways. First of all, are you ready right now? And second, are you ready for then? Remember St. Paul's history. Called by the Lord to be his apostle. Traveled over a great amount of the known world of his time preaching and teaching and leading people to the faith. As Paul got near the end, he was in Jerusalem, and it was prophesied that Paul would soon be captured and he would soon die, and that happened. The Jews hated Paul, and a number of them took a vow to kill him, and they were not going to eat again until they pulled that off. But a young man who's unnamed caught wind of that, went to the authorities and said, here's what's going to happen. And so the Roman authorities took Paul into custody and took him into custody, took him out of Jerusalem with 470 soldiers. This was a big deal. Paul was in prison for two years waiting to appeal to Caesar. Paul was then in Rome under house arrest for a couple more years. And now the time has come and Paul's about to die and he knows that. He says, At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. You see, when Paul was arrested, he appealed to Caesar for a hearing. A Roman citizen had the right to do that, could literally appeal to the king of the world for a hearing. And that happened. Paul testified to the gospel in front of Caesar's court. Now, we don't know what the results of that were. Did anybody believe? We have no idea. But the gospel was preached in Emperor Nero's court. And not too long after that, Paul would be executed. Paul says, everybody deserted me. Yet, he forgives them. And he puts the credit where credit is due. The Lord stood at my side and gave me strength. And he says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. The Lord kept Paul safe because ultimately we are only safe because the Lord makes it that way. It is true that we love and support each other. And that's an important thing and we'll talk about that some more in a bit. But it's the Lord who keeps us safe because we are his now and forever. Paul says he will rescue me from every evil attack. Are you ready to meet your Savior right now? Certainly, as Christians, we believe that. We believe I'm ready to meet my Savior. I'm looking forward to that. But there's also a difference between I'm ready in general to meet my Savior and really getting close. If you're close to that, why is that? Is that because perhaps you're old and life expectancy says it may be soon? Or is it because it just got way more real you had a stroke, 
or heart attack, or you got diagnosed with an incurable disease, or maybe there's been an accident of some kind and you are not physically, mentally what you were. One thing to remember as we talk about this over the next few minutes is that the Lord knows the days he has allotted to us. And a complete Christian life may be 75 or 80 years around the life expectancy of an American. But a complete Christian life may also be the five or six years of a child who's called to heaven, what we might say early, but in the Lord's wisdom is the right time and a full Christian life. Paul says this, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Paul's nearly done. He knows it. How can he be so strong? How can he be so optimistic? Because he knows who keeps him safe. Look at what he says. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. But the emphasis is not on Paul. And the idea here is an athletic contest. It's not war. But the language here suggests an athletic contest. Kind of ironic since we're in the middle of the Olympics this week. Paul's been strong. Paul's been faithful to the word. But nonetheless, it's the Lord who gets every ounce of the credit. And look at what Paul says. The Lord, the righteous judge, will give me the crown of righteousness. The Lord literally awards this because he is generous, not because we've earned or deserved it. Wages of sin is death. That's why we die. You look in the world around you, you see the results of sin, you see the hardships sin creates, the things we suffer because of it, and again, ultimately, death. One to a person, and that doesn't change. But the Lord has delivered us from that. The Savior's delivered us from our natural sinfulness, the Savior's delivered us from each of our sins, and we don't need to go into a whole bunch of them here. You know what your sins are. And you know that you're not deserving of heaven. But because the Lord is good, he's given you that freely by his grace. Let's look for a few moments at death and dying. And let's look at some practical things with that. As I mentioned before, it's one thing to say, and we do believe, that we're ready to meet our God now because he's given us faith in his forgiveness and a look, and a hope, and a belief in eternal life. But it's harder when you get close. It's harder when, like we said, the big event comes. Stroke, heart attack, cancer, accident. Maybe just a disease of some kind, just some kind of physical failure. Harder when it gets close. So what do you need to do? Well, the first thing you need to do is remember your baptism. We had a baptism this morning, little Aaron Eady, who is called now by God to be his own. Sins forgiven, faith created, and God's commitment, just as he's made to each of you. We look at that first, that God called us to be his. We look at the blessing of the sacrament where the Savior says to us, take, eat, and drink because your sins are forgiven. Not your sins may be forgiven, not some kind of conditional thing if you clean up your act, but your sins have been forgiven now and forever. Separated as far as the east is from the west, as one of the Psalms says. That's what you look at. And you look at the Savior's word which says to you loud and clear each day, take heart because this is true. And we'll look at some more of that word in a minute. Now, how do you deal with this in a practical way if it's a family member who now is up against this? Well, the first thing is be there. Is death hard? Yes, death is hard. Death is a separation. It's a separation from people we love, and that can be brutal. Sometimes we know it's coming, and the grieving comes partly before people leave us and some of the grieving after. Sometimes it's a shocker, like say an accident of some kind and all the grieving is later. Either one is not easy. 
Either one hurts. But you need to be there. You need to be there with support. And yes, maybe grandma had a stroke, and what you'd like to remember about grandma is when she sat you on her lap and read those books to you when you were a kid or taught you a hymn or something like that. But be there when she's in the hospital bed and she's drooling and she can't speak because your presence matters because it's love. The father that you've loved, who was always the big strong man and had everything under control and you may have been in awe of, he weighs 110 pounds now because cancer has ravaged what was there. But you need to be there. And yeah, he hurts, and yeah, he moans from the pain, but you can hold his hand and talk about the Savior's love. You are at the bedside with your spouse that you've known and loved for so many years, and you're doing some of the best works of your marriage as the clock ticks to the end. Is it as fun as the beginning? No. Is it as fun as when the kids were growing up? No. But it's necessary and it's beautiful and it's some of the finest good works that you'll ever do. I had a family in Florida in a congregation I served there and mom had cancer. Dad was still around. Four kids from Wisconsin. They came down for the last week. And they would stand around mom's bed and they would sing hymns and they would speak of the word of the Savior. And it was beautiful. It was hard, but it was beautiful. And they planned her funeral, all six of them, because she wanted part in it before the Lord took her to heaven. And so they're going through scripture readings, and they were going through hymns. And they mentioned one hymn, and she said, well, you can't sing that, I'll be sad. And she said, wait a second, I'm not going to be there. You see, your end is the beginning of heaven and it is a mark of God's grace because we don't live in this world forever because we're not created to be here forever. We're created to be with the Savior forever. Are the goodbyes hard? Yes. But they are good goodbyes because we know what the future is. As you grieve, That'll be hard. As I mentioned before, some of it may be before the death. Some of it may be after. All of it may be after if it's more sudden. It's okay. You're going to grieve because you've loved. You're going to grieve because God made us human and social. But grieve with his word and grieve with hope. And yes, there will be all kinds of conflicting emotions. Some will be flat-out grief. Some will be things you remember. Some will be, what did we mess up? Some will be relief. Some will be joy that the person's gone to heaven. They're all in there. It's all mixed together, and that's okay. You're not disloyal if you feel relief after a long siege of illness and the person's gone to heaven. You're not disloyal when you rejoice at the fact that we know our people go to heaven because that's what God made us for. As we close over the next few minutes, let's look at what our Savior says about heaven. First of all, let's remember what it's not. A whole bunch of things that we're really familiar with. First of all, there is no sin. There is no temptation. There is no devil harassing us and trying to drag us from the faith. There is no disappointment. There is no fear. There is no doubt. There is no horrid phone call at three in the morning that someone has been severely hurt or died. There are not those separations of death. And then think about what there is. And as we look at this, just close your eyes and listen. Just close your eyes and listen to what the Lord says. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And then the words of Job. We talked about Job a couple weeks ago in dealing with suffering. And Job said this, the beautiful Easter words, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. 
That's what God's made you for. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. And Jesus said, when Lazarus died, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Paul reminds us of how we've got one foot on earth and one foot in heaven. He says, I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But then he also went on to say, but I know that for a while God's going to leave me here because I have things to do in serving you yet. And as long as each of us remains in this world, we have things to do for serving our Savior and those around us yet. Paul talked about grief and teaches us how to grieve. He says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with, those, or bring G- with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left at the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive will left and be left will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. And Jesus said to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. You know the place where I am going. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except me. Paul would write to the Corinthians in a reading that we often use for Easter. The perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. We will be raised with brand new bodies, reunited with our souls in absolute perfection. The kind of perfection that Adam and Eve had when they were created. And even better because it's heaven itself. And there will be so many there. John says in his revelation... Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And finally, we conclude with more of John's revelation, the next to last book in the Bible. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Amen.